Hey, why are you talking? You're supposed to be making cartoon. Well, we just thought it would be kind of fun to talk a little bit about our Baldur's Gate experience that we had playing the game. And boy, was it a blast. I'm pretty sure our story is probably very similar to a lot of other people's because I think we all went into the game with an expectation. And then to have our expectations completely uh, blown out of the water, I think we all have that in common. That's for sure. So I just want to share a couple things that I think, you know, it might be a little interesting that, that you guys might not know, you know, some inside stories, inside drama, if you will, of the Carpot origin story of our Baldur's Gate characters. So without further ado, I'm just going to jump into it. First of all, let's talk about our four main characters here. We did use these characters, although actually we started with a druid, not a bard, and then he turned into a bard later. Misdemeanor was my character. I was the rogue. Jonathan, uh, I'm Andrew, by the way. Jonathan was Hagen Dust. That was his actual name, who, who accidentally, by the way, picked the Dark Urge. He didn't know. So what he did was he was looking through all the legacy characters and Dark Urge is at the very end, right? He clicked on all of them to see what who they were and what they were. And he clicked on Dark Urge. And then he didn't realize what he was doing. He just went straight to customize. And he didn't know he was still on Dark Urge. And he changed himself to a dwarf. And for the first, I'd say, five to ten hours of the game, we had no idea he was the Dark Urge. And that made it all the more fun. It's like cutting off Gale's hand and killing squirrels. And we didn't know what was going on because he had zero control over these interactions. But anyway, so our other two cousins, Jordan and Josh, they were uh, our, they're our cousins. And they played with us. And Jordan was the uh, bard. And Josh was the wizard. And they <laughs> they were trying to be really cool with their names. I believe their names were Vala de Lar and Sal de Zizar. They were, they were trying really, really hard, so we decided to change their names for the cartoon. And we thought of Ban Jovi, and we couldn't think of another name for the wizard, so we just kept his name as the player, which is my cousin Josh. So he's kept it Josh. So that's how our characters came to be. Moving to episode one. This actually happened, by the way. I was trying to figure out how to lockpick something, and then Jonathan picked up the thing I was lockpicking and put it in his pocket. And I was like, what? hey, <laughs> I was picking that. That actually happened. A lot of all these other things that you might see, like they're all honest interactions, but we, they may have happened in other areas. And we felt that they were really beneficial in this particular cartoon. Actually, 99% of the time, they are very, very true experiences, but we do move them around for the sake of the cartoons. We're just gonna take a quick break. Word from our sponsor. Who's our sponsor? Uh, Dragon Air, it's D&D related. This video is sponsored by Dragonair. Compared with the first phase, phase two of the D&D collaboration provides players with richer game content than before. Dragonair is an open world strategy RPG with the Western fantasy theme, which integrates the classic Western TRPG gameplay represented by Dungeons and Dragons. You know what that means, dice rolls, character customization, dungeon battles, and other gameplay like that. It has garnered over 10 million downloads worldwide, securing top spot in more than 10 regions since its global launch. If that's not a big deal, I don't know what is. After the iconic D&D characters, remember, remember these guys, Drizzt and Ertu made their appearance in the game. Remember that? Dragonair Silent Gods has now officially launched phase two of their Dungeons and Dragons collaboration. Two legendary mages are going to be there, by the way. Elminster, Armar, and Samaster. They will be making their debut. There's a new collaboration story, too, by the way. In this collab, players embark on a D&D adventure facing the cult of the dragon and their necromatic threat. Join forces with Elminster to defeat Samaster and unravel the uh, mystery of the Draculich. You can also join collaboration events like boss challenges and summoning for exclusive rewards like Elminster artifacts, dice skins, avatar frames. Dragonair is now live on PC, Mac, Steam, and the Epic Game Store, and it's compatible with both mobile platforms, Android and iOS. Experience the adventure of a lifetime in Dragonair's Phase 2 of D&D Collaboration. Join now and conquer the cult of the dragon today. Episode three, this is where Jonathan, this is where he found his identity. Right around this point in the game, Josh, our mage, started buffing Jonathan with jump, and he loved it so much, he just kept saying, give me jump, give me jump, give me jump. <laughs> And it ended up being like Josh was his drug dealer. He kept being like, here, give me more. Okay, I got I got you, bro. <laughs> so he kept giving him the jump power. And this battle right outside of the gate, we had one of our first huge laughing fits where we just couldn't stop laughing because of what transpired it was pretty ridiculous. At least, at least at that point when we were so new to the game. So Josh had shot some ice on the ground. I, this doesn't exactly happen here, but we moved this stuff to other episodes. But Josh shot some ice on the ground. Jonathan uses his jumping power. He wasn't even near the battle, by the way. I think he jumped into the battle from really far away. He jumped in and he landed next to the guy that got hit by the ice. The guy had one hit point. I believe it was the big guy of the group. The hug bear or whatever the frig they're called. I don't know. So Jonathan jumps onto the ice, immediately slips and falls over to this guy that has one health. And then it turns to that guy's turn. That guy stabs him with something and then jumps away. We just thought that was freaking hilarious. We didn't know you could slip on ice. We didn't know any of that. So it all was a huge surprise. Like this game just kept surprising us. Episode four. Yes, Jonathan absolutely killed that squirrel. Also, we did end up reloading the save many times. We were unaware 
everywhere that touching things angered people and got the cops involved. It was, it was very, very scary. We weren't quite at the point where we're like, hey, let's just deal with our decisions. We weren't confident enough. Uh, we did end up safe scumming a few times in a lot of towns like this. Okay, so this happened actually in a different playthrough, but we laughed super hard at it. Someone summoned a uh, boulder of fire. It was their turn to control the boulder. It was so funny to us that we could see where the boulder was looking. It would like turn itself over, around and around it as if it had a face basically, but without actually having one. The way it would like climb ladders and climb cliffs. We just thought that it was so uh, human, but it still maintained its boulder. It was too funny to pass up, so we had to throw it in this episode. It was super, super funny to us. Okay, so this didn't actually happen until the end of act two, where our bard, Jordan, had survived an explosion and was standing amidst fire in all the wreck. He was just standing in fire, but it was his turn, and he was really thinking of what to do next. As he was thinking of what to do, we all just started laughing because he was standing in fire for at least two minutes. Usually Jordan takes a few a few minutes to think of what he's gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that he was standing in fire the whole time and he wasn't getting hurt, we found that to be pretty funny. So he stuck it in this episode. And then, of course, for him to just make a few strums, run out and slip on the ice, it just added to the comedic effect. We thought that was pretty good. So here we actually did stop the windmill, I believe. I don't know. I've, I've played through the game like four times at this point. So I can't remember if our group play, we actually launched. John, do you remember if we did? Jonathan? Huh? Do you remember if... We, the guy on the windmill, we actually launched him or we saved him? We saved him? Okay. So we actually didn't launch him in our group playthrough. We saved him. And it was actually by accident. At this point, our bard wasn't a bard. He was a druid. And we were at the top of the windmill because we knew we had to fight all these guys. And we snuck around back. And we got to the top of the windmill. And we were going to shoot all these goblins from above. We didn't know that if you kill the leader, they all run away. We didn't know that. We were like, okay, we're gonna. there's a huge fight. There's like 10 goblins here. So we got to basically prepare for this fight. So we sat up top there. And Jordan, turning into a spider, was like, hey, I'm going to web the ground. So when they try and climb up, they'll get stuck. So he webs the ground. It covers the entire bottom floor of the windmill. And what did it do? The webbing lodged the two mechanisms that you can pull. And it, st and it stopped the windmill. The webbing did that. That was the first time our minds were blown. We we're like, oh my gosh, this game is sick. And it was so cool to see that, that the webbing actually stopped the windmill. It was just a crazy, crazy wake-up call to the whole experience of the game. And that's, I think, right around the time where we were like, we wanted to start experimenting with all this kind of stuff. It was super fun. Okay, so here, we definitely tried Barrelmancy. It just wasn't as successful as, th as this in the cartoon. We didn't have this many barrels. I think we only had like one and the goblins wouldn't let us touch their barrels, so we couldn't move them. So what we had to do is we had to move one of ours close to one of theirs, and then lure them all to those two barrels and kill like probably a third of them, somewhere around there. And Jordan, being a really good bait, he went over there and he played some songs for them, and they all came running over, and I think that's when we did turn-based mode and chaos ensued, but yeah. It was not as grand and epic as the cartoon, but it was still fun. Volo in our playthrough actually didn't die here either. We just thought it'd be funny if he died in the explosion, but he didn't die here. He actually made it back to our camp. He survived, well, <laughs> for the time being. And I guess Jonathan had a conversation with him. He did the whole sequence where he he thinks he can get the thing out of your brain by stabbing you in the eye. So he like dabs Jonathan in the eye, but I think he saw the bat. I don't even know. I wasn't part of this cinematic. I wasn't listening in. Bolo decided to run away. And so people, everyone started throwing crap at him and we they killed him. I think Jonathan and someone else, maybe Josh or someone killed him. And so Jonathan decided to stick Volo in his pants and take him everywhere he went, like a, his toy doll, basically. He took it around everywhere and showed him all the sights and sounds and of Baldur's Gate 3. It was basically his best friend at that point for the rest of the game. This spectator Pokeball strategy was not used by us. As a matter of fact, I don't even know what we did with that thing because I don't think we knew what it did. Someone must have just sold it. We don't know where it went. We actually got this from Day 9's playthrough where he threw it thinking it would capture an ogre, but really it just shot out a spectator and the spectator killed all the goblins for him as he ran away. I think there was one goblin left by the end and he killed it himself. What a great accidental strategy. Thought it was so funny. We wanted to throw it into our cartoon as well. But what happened happened after with the ogres, you know, coming through the ceiling and us negotiating with them absolutely happened action for action. It was so fun. <laughs> we killed all the all the goblins and the ogres were all still there and alive and they're like, hey, we didn't get to eat enough. And as Jordan, being the charismatic bard, talking to the ogres, Jonathan was like, hey, there's a brazier above them. I should hit it and it'll hit them and then we could kill them and take their stuff. And Jordan's like, no, no, wait, wait, I'm going to talk to them. Maybe we, they can fight for us again. And Jonathan goes, I don't know. I really want to do do it. Basically having a, a, a dark urge moment in real life. Jordan's like, no, wait, just stop. Hold on. Jordan's like, I don't know. Jordan's like, don't do it. And the 
had a few moments of silence pass. It hit the brazier, it landed on the ogres, and the ogres immediately killed Jordan. And everybody else ran away. I think Josh blinked up into the scaffolding of above. I went invisible because I stole the Dark Urge cape from, from Jonathan. He didn't even know he got a Dark Urge cape from his little goblin butler because it happened before he joined the game. So I stole the cape as a rogue. It was so beneficial to me, and I never told him that I stole it from him. So surprise, Jonathan, I stole your cape. Anyway, Jordan died. We all laughed, and it was pretty funny. Ultimately, Baldur's Gate 3 is just an amazing game that is just full of surprises. I follow a lot of creators that have played it for over a thousand hours, and they're still finding things that they have never seen before. And truly, it deserved Game of the Year. Game of the, I don't know, maybe the next few years. Uh, what, a, what an achievement. Thank you, Baldur's Gate, for all these amazing experiences, and thank you guys for watching. We really have fun. We've had a lot of fun playing the game, and we have a lot of fun doing the cartoons. And we love reading your uh, comments, and we love it when people react to our cartoons. So if anyone out there is reacting to them, thank you so much. We love watching them as well. All right, see you later. Carbot teams, Team Carbot says we'll talk to you later.